and the uh, English scripture reading comes from the epistle of James, chapter 4, and I will be reading verses 8 through 10. James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. James says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning, and I will call upon Bob Militarian to deliver the English sermon this morning. The calendar says Christmas is just around the corner. It will soon arrive. Have you something special to look forward to? Like a family reunion, meeting your grandchildren, having a Christmas dinner with your friends, family and loved ones? Life becomes more exciting if we have something to look forward to. I love this Christmas season. I greatly appreciate the Christmas decorations. I love the twinkling lights, the beautiful Christmas trees, the jolly Santas in the malls, the hunk stockings. But most of all, or best of all, I, I love the the Christmas music. I greatly appreciate the Christmas carols. I can sing, but it's a, always an enjoyment to listen to good music. The Christmas music that I hear is very uplifting. It makes me happy and trans makes me forget the problems of the world. And for a time, I'm transported to heaven. The Armenians have a nice saying. They say, Translated into English means, only the evil people don't have songs. So, we are rich in having uh, Christmas carols and religious hymns of all sorts of old stripes. I am, of course, acutely aware of the fact that many Christians are unhappy with the commercialization of the Christmas holiday. Because it brings a lot of tension and stress. Even though the Christmas season is a nice holiday, it can also be very distracting. It's so easy to get involved in the many material aspects of the holiday that we forget to focus on the main reason for its celebration. Why do we celebrate Christmas? We do so because we rem remember how God, through his great love, decided to send his only son to this sinker's world to seek and to save those who are lost in sin. In ancient times, the Armenians used to fast for two weeks prior to Christmas in order to prepare themselves to receive Christ into their lives. Nowadays, only monks who live in monasteries observe this two-week-long Christmas fast. But the ordinary church members don't follow this custom anymore. One of the Christmas carols that we like very much is titled 
joy to the world, the Lord is come. There's one line in that carol that caught my attention. It says, let every heart prepare him room. Are we doing that? My hope and wish is that every one of us will have a real and personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ during this coming Advent season. Right after Thanksgiving, the, Christ the Christmas rush started, and now as we get closer to, to the holiday, things will get more hectic. A little girl who watched how preoccupied her parents had become with their Christmas shopping, baking, house cleaning, wrapping of presents and setting up the Christmas tree, that she felt that her parents no longer had any time for her. This poor girl thought that her parents had neglected her. She felt that her parents had forgotten that she even existed. Her fears were justified when one day her parents told her, would you please get out of the way? One December night, this little girl, dejected and sad, knelt by her bedside and prayed, Dear God, please forgive our Christmas madness. When I ask the question, are you ready for Christmas? I'm, gonna ask, I'm not asking about your activities. I'm asking about your attitudes. Every now and then, I hear someone say, I just can't get into the spirit of Christmas. Have you heard that expression? With that in mind, let us once again think about what Christmas really means. God expressed his enormous love for us humans that he sent his only son to our world in the likeness of a man to teach us how to live a righteous life, how to overcome and defeat temptations, and how to be saved from the dominion of sin. What attitudes must we adopt during the Advent season? Joseph, the man to whom the Virgin Mary was engaged, doesn't stay very long in the spotlight of the Christian narrative. But he has a lot to, cheat, to, cheat, to teach us about the right attitude about Christmas. For a moment, I want you to, visual, to visualize yourself in Joseph's position. He was engaged to the Virgin Mary, whom she loved and whom he wanted to marry. He had made all the necessary arrangements for the wedding, which was going to happen soon. Then, one day, Mary approached and I said, Joseph, I have to tell you something. I'm expecting a child. Those words must have hit Joseph like a bombshell. Because he knew he wasn't the father. 
he concluded that his fiancée had been unfaithful to him. If Joseph told the general public that his fiancée had become pregnant without being intimate with him, she would have been stoned to death. That was the penalty which the law of Moses prescribed for adultery and for every woman, for every woman who got pregnant before marriage. Joseph loved, very, loved Mary very much and he didn't want to see her stoned to death. He didn't want to disgrace her or shame her publicly. So he decided the best thing to do was to quietly break the engagement contract. As Joseph was thinking about the decision, God sent him an angel to reassure him that his, his fiancée was a pure woman, that she had conceived by a special action of the Holy Spirit without any man touching her and that the child she's bearing is the Son of God and he was told once the child is born he should name him Jesus Yeshua in Hebrew which means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation so Joseph didn't have the privilege of choosing a name for Mary's child. That name had been chosen by God himself. Because Joseph was a man of faith, he trusted God. Sometimes it's very hard to live by faith. And let me tell you why it's hard to live by faith sometimes. If God always does what we expect him to do, it would be very easy to live by faith. But when God doesn't do what we expect him to do, then the difficulty arises. Joseph accepted God's will even though he could not fully understand it. Joseph obeyed God's will and he did everything that he had been instructed to do. Today we find ourselves pretty much in the same position, Joseph found himself. Christmas promises to bring peace, but there is conflict all around us. Christmas promises to bring us joy, but there is so much sadness in this world. Christmas promises to bring us love, but there is so much hatred. So, like Joseph, in anguish we cry out, O oh God, why is it this way? And God tells us, trust me, my child, the outcome shall be beneficial for you. So Joseph teaches us to adopt the attitude of trusting God, believing that whatever looks to us as a tragedy, he can transform it into an advantage for us. The second lesson we learn from Joseph is to care for other people. 
not to be selfish, but to care for the people around us. The task that God had assigned to Joseph was to take care of Mary and the baby Jesus. When Joseph accepted this responsibility, he didn't think or he didn't know that he would be forced one day to flee with Mary and Jesus to Egypt to save them from the wrath of King Herod. He didn't know that he had to close up his carpentry shop in Nazareth for a long period of time. He didn't know the demands that this responsibility would make on his time on, and on his pocketbook. Yet, he accepted the Lord's will and followed God's instructions as faithfully as he could. So, the kind of Christmas you will have will depend largely on the attitude you adopt. If you choose to follow the example of Joseph and react to the situations that you face the same way he did, you will have a blessed Christmas. There's a book that I encountered whose title intrigued me. The, uh, the book was titled Skipping Christmas, written by John Grisham, and for some time it made the New York bestsellers list. The author tells us about a couple, a married couple, Luther and Nora, who decided to avoid the frenzy that is traditionally associated with Christmas. Luther, the husband, had calculated that the previous year he had spent $6,000 on Christmas decorations, presents, food, and entertainment. So this year he decided, for one year he decided to avoid that stress and pressure by skipping Christmas. So they, they didn't buy any presents, they didn't set up Christmas tree, they didn't go shopping, they didn't clean the house, they did not do any baking. Instead, they bought tickets for a 10 day long Caribbean cruise. So they wanted to enjoy themselves and avoid the stress and the pressure of Christmas. To them it made sense because they were experiencing the emptiness, the emptiness syndrome because their only daughter Blair had departed to Peru to start working for the Peace Corps. So they were all alone. The day before Christmas, when Luther and Nora were preparing their suitcase for the Caribbean cruise, suddenly they got a call from their daughter Blair. To their surprise, she's she said that she was at the Miami International Airport heading home for the Christmas holiday, accompanied by her Peruvian boyfriend, Enrique, to surprise her parents. And then Blair asked if uh, they were, if the parents were going to prepare that traditional Christmas dinner party. Nora didn't know what to say. She panicked, but she said yes. Then chaos followed. Luther dashed out of the house, went to the marketplace in search of a Christmas tree. 
And Nora scrambled to find food in the pantry. They had only 10 hours to get ready for Christmas, to clean the house, to put up the decorations and cook the food. To their great surprise, their neighbors came in to help them. Each neighbor brought something to help this family get out of that uh, predicament. And then Luther had a change of heart. His next door neighbor, Walter, and his wife, Bev, had gone through a great ordeal because Bev contracted cancer. But she was in the remission during the Advent season. So Luther and Nora thought, since that Caribbean cruise tickets were not refundable, they gave them to their neighbor, Walter and Bev, to go and enjoy the Caribbean cruise. The conclusion is that you may try to skip Christmas, but you won't be able to do that. There are some people who look at Christmas as a burden, as a time of stress, as a time of extra work, and that deprives them from having the religious experience associated with the holiday. The physical aspects of Christmas are not as important as the religious significance. What goes in your heart and mind, the attitude that you adopt, they'll decide whether you'll have a blessed Christmas or a burdensome Christmas. Christian's book concludes with a very interesting statement, it says Luther and Nora found the true meaning of Christmas, that the true meaning of Christmas is love and sharing, love and sharing. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's the first Sunday of the Advent season. A time of anticipation for good things to come. A time to reflect on what you have done for our salvation. A time to focus on the glorious future that will be realized. You have made promises that you alone can keep. You give us peace that can be found nowhere else. You've given us a hope that you alone can fulfill. We praise you, Father, and we worship you. And as we journey toward Christmas, fill our hearts with gratitude and joy. May this entire Advent season bring us back to the manger of Bethlehem back to the cross of Calvary and back to the empty tomb to gain a reassurance that you can lead us from defeat to victory, from despair to hope, from the ravages of war to the enjoyment of peace, from destruction to restoration through Jesus Christ our Lord in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh,